Welcome to the Engineering Gals featuring Space Gals YouTube live seminar. I'm your co-founder and co-host, Maritza Bravo. Engineering Gals was founded in 2016. It is an online community for engineers. Our mission is to educate the public about engineering and inspire the youth to become engineers. Thank you to everyone who donated to our GoFundMe campaign. 
All proceeds would be donated to family financially affected by COVID-19. Hi everyone, it's your co-founder and co-host Amy Carr. Welcome to the Engineering Gals featuring Space Gals YouTube live seminar. Thank you for being here. If you're if you entered the giveaway contest, please stay tuned till the end to claim your prize, a Google Home Mini. And just a reminder, this event is not sponsored or endorsed by any government, corporation, or entity. It's an independent event hosted by Engineering Gals. Today, we have a lineup of extraordinary engineers working in the space industry. Our first panelist is a chemical engineer working on some of the coolest projects for the International Space Station, Marianne Gonzalez. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Marianne, and I've been working in the space industry for about five years. And my background is chemical engineering, and I did my undergrad at Long Beach State, my master's at USC. And I also, some, a fun fact about me is I love to snowboard. So that's one of uh, the things I love to do. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne, for being here today. Uh, we have our second panelist, Naya Butler-Craig. She is an aerospace PhD research candidate. Hi, everybody. Thanks for jumping on. Um, as Amy said, my name is Naya Butler-Craig. I'm currently a PhD student studying aerospace engineering at Georgia Tech in Atlanta. And um, I work at NASA Glenn um, during the summers as a Pathways intern, and I'm super excited to be here. Thank you so much, Naya. We are so lucky to have you here today. Our third panelist is an electrical engineer who has worked on the Mars 2020 rover project, Katia Echazareta. Hi, everybody. My name is Katya. I'm so happy you could join us. Um, so I've been obsessed with space my entire life. You'll see a picture of me later on as a little kid in a mission control center. And I did my undergrad at UCLA in electrical engineering. During my junior year there, I started interning at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, where I just completed my second year anniversary there. Um, so I'm really excited to tell you guys all about it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katia. I can't wait to hear more about your projects. Um, next up, we have our fourth panelist, an aerospace engineer, Kate Gunderson. Hi, guys. It's so good to meet you. I'm glad you could join us today. Um, like uh, Amy said, I'm an aerospace engineer, and I work at uh, NASA's Johnson Space Center, where I started interning back in 2013 when I was an undergrad at the Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. And I can't wait to talk to you more today. Um, and yeah, I'm glad you could join us. Thanks, Kate. Um, today, our agenda includes panel presentations and discussions. We will be discussing academia, how to get an internship and pay for grad school, mental health, dealing with imposter, imposter syndrome, and how to deal with failure and provide advice from our panelists. Now our panelists will go into more detail about what they do for the space industry. Please welcome our first panelist, Marianne. Hi everyone. Thanks again for tuning in. Uh, let's see here. So my name is Marian Gonzalez, and like I said, I've been working in the space industry for about five years. My first uh, NASA position was at Kennedy Space Center in 2015. I worked there as a summer intern, and then I eventually got an internship at Jet Propulsion Lab, and then I eventually became hired full time. And uh, this is me. This at this uh, vehicle assembly building in Kennedy Space Center. And I got to watch a lot of cool launches while I was there. And it was just like a once in a lifetime experience that I'll never forget. So some of the stuff that I work on uh, includes 
March 2020. So this is the first project I got to work on at JPL. And specifically, I worked on Moxie. And essentially, they want to be able to produce oxygen on Mars autonomously. And the advantage of that is that you could use oxygen to create what rocket fuel or have oxygen for life support. And what I got to do was deliver optical sensors to look at the composition of the gas that was coming out. And I also got to do some design work as well. And I also got to build a huge simulation model of operation on Mars. So understanding the conditions on Mars and how all our instruments are gonna to work together to produce oxygen. And you can see here, on uh, this picture is the rover and it's going to be on its way to Mars in July. So it's coming up really quickly and I'm super excited. And yeah, it's very exciting. And another thing I work on is the ISS uh, projects. So some of those involve like life support systems and environmental monitoring. So this launch here in this video is actually from last year when I got to go back to Kennedy Space Center and, you know, uh, talk to some old uh, friends and colleagues there. It was great. And then I got to watch the instrument launch to the ISS on a Falcon 9 and also got to watch the Falcon 9 land its boosters. And it was a great experience. My family came with me as well. And it was super fun. So spacecraft atmosphere monitor is essentially looking at the cabin air. So is the cabin air safe for the astronauts? And I got to work on some of the integration and testing of this instrument and making sure everything's okay. And then I also got to work on the gas chromatograph part of this instrument as well. It's another analytical chemistry uh, component. And uh, another project I get to work on for the ISS is the TOCA. So this basically looks at water and then tells you if the water is safe to consume because a lot of the water on the space station is actually recycled. And we have to make sure that everything's okay and that, that the astronauts can consume it. So this is an older generation TOCA that looks at carbon and water. And then we're actually going to send another one in 2023, which is a little bit more compact, efficient, and it's meant to go to like lunar missions and Mars missions. So it's meant to be a long duration instrument. So that's some of the stuff that I do. And some other projects I got to work on was a lunar rover concept. So Essentially, you look at the regolith or the soil on the moon and you heat it up and it volatilizes and then you can extract water to use for resources. And this also looks at other components that might be in the soil as well. So it has some scientific value to it as well. And another thing that I worked on was a concept for a very far future mission, which will be a melt probe for the, a moon called Europa on Jupiter. And it looks at if there's microbial life underneath its ice layer. So there were some missions that found plumes coming out of these uh, ice layers. So we're suspecting that there might be microbial life underneath the ice and in the ocean. So we want to send a melt probe there to, to look at it. So that's one of the stuff I get to work on. So I have some trivia for you guys. And I will look at the comments here on YouTube live. And you guys should write in your answer. I kind of want to see what the response is. So my, my trivia is how many times did we land on the moon? Was it once, was it six, or was it 17 times? And then I just included some cool footage here of the Apollo missions, the launch, and it was really funny video of astronauts kind of hopping around. I love these, I love this footage so much. So I'm gonna, I know there's a little bit of a delay on the YouTube live, so I'll wait a little bit, but uh, 
we did have a total of 17 Apollo missions. So how many of those did we actually land? Okay, I see some answers here. All right, some people say six times. Yeah, okay, great. Awesome, that's correct. So that's six times. Right, there were 17 total and Apollo 11 to 17, with the exception of Apollo 13. So if you know the, the movie Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks, you know that they had malfunctions and there was a planned landing, but it just didn't end up happening. But thankfully, the astronauts got back safe. So that's an awesome story. Yeah, thanks everyone, you guys got it right. Um, so that's it for my intro. Uh, thanks again for tuning in and I'll pass it along to the next panelist. Thank you, you guys. Thank you so much, Marianne, for presenting. Our next presenter is Naya. Naya, please go ahead. Will do. Take to share my screen. Okay. Okay, so uh, like Marissa said, my name is Maya Butler-Craig and this is my presentation for the Space Files where I'm just gonna get um, a little bit more, I guess, in depth about what I do technically. So like I said, I'm currently an aerospace engineering PhD suit in Georgia Tech. I work in the high power electric propulsion lab there where I'm a GEM fellow. GEM stands for Graduate Education for Minorities. So that's one of the fellowships that's helped funding my education there. And then the fellowship I just obtained this um, past April is actually called the NASA Space Technology Graduate Research Fellow. It's a mouthful. Um, it was formerly known as the NASA Space Technology Research Fellowship. So change of name, um, so you might be familiar with it, where I'm also funded, uh, I'm, they also fund my graduate school as well as give me opportunities to work at NASA centers during the summer as a visiting technologist. So um, I also have my BS in aerospace engineering from Emma Riddle Aeronautical University, which is in Daytona Beach. And my concentration was astronautics and my minors were in computational and applied math. And finally, my life goal is to be an astronaut someday, which I'm sure a lot of you feel the same. <laughs> So here's a little bit about my work experience. Um, I'm just gonna go from the left side, top left to the screen to the bottom right. Um, top left is my first, uh, what is it called? Internship, where I was um, working at Draper Lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I did quality software engineering on the Dream Chaser cargo, which is in the top left here. And that is a kind of cargo resupply mission um, almost like a new age space shuttle. And I had the opportunity to do quality engineering for their software product development um, at Draper Labs, which is a contractor from the, um, from the actual company that's building the, the spacecraft, which is called Sierra Nevada Corp. And then moving on to um, in 2019, I spent my time at uh, Los Alamos National Laboratories. Unfortunately, my photo is not of hardware or anything super cool, it's just me, because you can't actually take pictures there. Um, so there I was working in the computational physics department where I actually did astrophysics. Um, totally different and totally tangent um, from what I've ever done before. I'm an aerospace engineer and in astrophysics, however, the fundamentals of plasma physics, it's still very the same. So I learned a lot of plasma physics that can be applied to what I'm studying now in electric propulsion. So coming to the far right, this is um, at NASA Glenn where I worked on something called the Albus CubeSat, which is the CubeSat um, to the right of that picture. Um, and here's a photo of me working on it. This was summer of 2017 when I, this is my first summer working as a pathways intern there. And the Albus CubeSat is really just a technology demonstration to demonstrate how much um, power you can generate in a small volume. And so if you're not familiar with, a, with what a CubeSat is, it's essentially um, a satellite condensed to 
about the size of a loaf of bread. So this picture here to give you some, <laughs> some perspective is about the length of your regular loaf of bread from Publix, from Kroger, or from wherever you decide to shop. And what's really cool about these is CubeSats are able to be used for a variety of space missions, but they're much cheaper and much uh, more easy to create because they're so small. And so if you imagine it, if you remember what a traditional satellite looks like, they're typically huge. Um, so CubeSats are condensing the operations of like a one ton satellite to the size of a loaf of bread. And so that summer I had the opportunity to work on the, um, on the thermal management. So I was doing some tests in something called thermal vacuum chambers, where we essentially um, simulate the orbital environment that the CubeSat was gonna be in. And um, we saw how different parts of our, our um, electronics responded to the, to the flux and temperature. So moving down to the bottom right, is summer of 2018, where I spent my time at NASA going again, and I worked on something called SKEP. And SKEP stands for sub-kilowatt electric propulsion. And so if you're not familiar with what electric propulsion is, um, I can go on forever because it's my favorite thing to talk about, but I'm just gonna give you an, an overview of what it is. And electric propulsion is basically, it's rocketry, but instead of using a chemical combustion, like a chemical rocket would, like you'd see at SpaceX on the Falcon Heavy, um, we're actually using electrons and ions to create thrust. And so these are not uh, rockets that you can use in the, um, to get off planet. Like you can't use them on, on the Earth's surface. You can only use them in space, in the vacuum of space. So what you see here is me working in a vacuum chamber. Um, we actually built this specific thruster from scratch. Um, and my job that summer was to do some component level tests. So. Um, this is actually called a Hall effect thruster, what I'm working on, and it's a class of electric propulsion um, where it accelerates the ions electrostatically to produce thrust. And by electrostatically, I just mean using an electric field. So positive, negative, and whatever field is generated between um, a positive and negative, um, what do you call it, cathode. And so um, I got the opportunity to work on that. This was 2018. It was really amazing. My first time touching an electric thruster. And this picture on the right with the blue, with the pretty blue uh, plume is actually what it looks like to fire one of those babies. And um, it brought me to tears. So that's what I do here actually at Georgia Tech, where I work in the high power electric propulsion lab. This is what we do all day. We test a bunch of different thrusters. Um, there's another type of thruster called an ion thruster that we also work on. I won't get into that because I don't have any pictures to show. Um, and finally, this summer coming up, uh, so summer 2020, I'm actually going back to NASA Glenn, um, although I'll be working remotely due to our current circumstances, but I'll be working on the Deep Space Gateway. And so if you're not familiar with the Deep Space Gateway, it's actually going to be the ISS of the moon. So it's gonna, um, it's gonna be a, the, the lunar kind of tag point for, um, for a, a variety of different mission objectives, whether it's landing, whether it's just uh, space missions, we're gonna be condensing those different operations to lunar orbit. And I'm really excited about that because this, the Deep Space Gateway will actually be using electric propulsion. And I personally will be doing trade studies on different electric thrusters to use for this spacecraft. So I'll get to learn a lot about um, systems engineering in this internship. And so fun fact about me, I actually had the opportunity to go to space with the Albus CubeSat because my name was written on one of the solar panels. <laughs> and this CubeSat was actually launched um, about a year and a half ago on the Rocket Labs Elena mission, which launched, ooh, I can't remember where it launched from, but it was not in the US. <laughs> and um, this is kind of my claim to fame. My name has been to space, therefore I have been to space. And so outside of that, I also like to launch model rockets. So I'm just gonna show a quick video. There's Lulu on an F-50. This should move real nice. Uh, purple and black, okay. There it stands for Excellent rocket and competition. All right. Launching on zero, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Yes! <laughs> oh, 
is gone. <laughs> So yes, excuse my uh, commentary at the end of that, but I had a lot of fun. This was an actual rocket um, I launched at Johnson Space Center for a competition between Pathways interns. Um, sorry about that. And then I just have a list of some organizations I've been involved with. I won't go into them, but um, I can definitely talk about these later. And so finally, um, I have some trivia for you guys. I didn't realize that Marianne was only doing one. <laughs> I wouldn't do this to you guys. So I'm just gonna choose one and, um, and maybe at the end we could answer the others. But my trivia question is, what was the first US mission to use electric propulsion? And so I'm gonna give you guys some time to catch up. I know it's a little delayed. So option A is Deep Space One, option B is a SpaceX Starlink, and option C is CERT, which stands for Space Electric Rocket Test, um, CERT One. So which one do you guys think was the first US mission to use electric propulsion? Okay, so I see A and B, and I see CERT. Okay, so two for C, three for C, okay, two for A, three for A, and four for C. Okay, I'm gonna give you guys the answer. The answer is C, <laughs> it's CERT one. Um, it's called the Space Electric Rocket Test because it was actually the first time that the US had sent up an ion thruster to be tested in space. And so this was the um, the, the godfather, godmother <laughs> of space electric rocket tests because this is the demonstration that prove ion thrusters are desirable, usable and efficient for space operations. So thank you guys for tuning in. I'm excited for the rest of the seminar. Thank you, Naya. Now we have our next panelist, um, Katia. All right, now I will share my presentation with you guys. Okay, so hi everybody, my name is Katia. My last name is a little crazy. It is pronounced Echazareta, and I am an electrical engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, like I mentioned, I just completed my two years there, and I'm so excited. I absolutely love it. Every day that I show up to work and I walk over to my office, I really, truly feel blessed. It's a beautiful environment. And I think just personally growing up and really admiring all of the work that JPL has done in the past, and the engineers and scientists that have worked there before and to know that I am having lunch on the same tables that they had lunch in in the past, it's, it's really a, a humbling experience for me. So some background about me, uh, I have a love space for as long as I can remember. Um, I remember my mom and I talking about me being an astronaut as young as maybe six or seven years old. So it's something that's always been a huge, huge passion of mine. And really, I, I think I have always known that I wanted to get into space exploration in some way as my career. So really, I don't think there's ever been too long of a time that I deviated from that. Um, I actually went to community college first in San Diego before I transferred to UCLA for my bachelor's degree. And while I was at UCLA, I received my internship during the school, uh, the school quarter. Um, I think this was really, really important for me because the proximity allowed me to work not only during the summer, but actually to stay working at JPL for my entire rest of my college career. So that really allowed me to keep learning, keep working, keep developing those relationships with my coworkers, with my mentors. Um, and I think ultimately it is what, what led me to my full-time job. Um, so I have a few pictures here. This is for my graduation. Um, this one is my mentor who actually looks really, really young. Yes? 
Hey, can you share your presentation? I'm not seeing it on the screen for some reason. Does that work? No, I don't see it. Okay, let me see. Sorry guys, <laughs> we're just trying to get the presentation up. Okay, I see it now. Perfect, so you guys see that? Awesome. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So here's my intro. <laughs> All right, and these are the photos I was talking about here. Um, this is my mentor at the top and the intern that I started with when I first started my internship. Um, here is a photo of me when I was in elementary school. I'm not sure how old, maybe 10 or 11. And it is a mission control setup at a science museum in San Diego. And I think I, I really have a lot of fond memories of this because when I remember when I did this, I knew all of the fun facts they were throwing out. It was a simulated mission to Mars. And for the first time, I think that I really felt that I had found a job where I could mix all of my passions together. So from here on is really when I decided that I wanted to work for NASA, essentially. So here is um the slide about my career at nasa jpl i have some photos here um, one of them is of me testing some of the systems we're developing the one at the bottom here is, is what we call a rack so this rack is essentially the uh the main deliverable that my group creates specifically my job is we build design and test equipment that simulate the spacecraft in order to test the flight electronics so what this means is that we create a simulation of our entire spacecraft. And then we connect all of the electronics that are going to be flying in this mission to it. So for example, the flight computer, we connect the flight computer to these racks and the flight computer thinks it is connected, ready to go, ready to fly. It is in the spacecraft. And then we try to test it. We try to break it. Um, we basically just try to figure out what can it do, what can it not do, and if there's anything that it is failing at, how can we fix it? So it's really awesome because with my work in my group, we're able to simulate entire spacecrafts for this. There's different levels. So first we have the computer itself, um, then we plug the computer into a bigger chunk of the spacecraft, and then we test that. And then once the spacecraft is ready, we test all of that again. Um, and I had mentioned the, the thermal chamber. So testing is one of the most important things of JPL. Without testing, we wouldn't be where we are. And I really, really think that our testing procedures are one of the most important things that, that JPL can deliver, really. So we test for temperature conditions. Um, the for example during a launch it's going to get really really hot we have to test for that when it's out in outer space it's going to get very cold we have to test for that for example voyager one of the um camera mechanisms froze because of the conditions and so for a while the camera couldn't rotate to take the photos that were necessary we have to make sure that things like that are not going to happen we have acoustic testing because it gets very loud during launch um, we have vibration testing. Again, things vibrate a lot during launch. So we have to make sure that everything is going to be okay. No wires are going to come undone. No resistors are going to chip off. So it is really one of the most important things that we can do. Some of the missions that I have participated in are the Mars 2020 rover. Um, I participated in testing for the robotic arm. I was able to, with my group, create an amplifier for it. The robotic arm, fun fact, the sensors on it are extremely sensitive for a reason, um, but that makes testing extremely difficult. For example, even blowing on it will register because of how sensitive they are. But in that case, when we're testing, how do we know it's an actual touch as opposed to wind? So we had to create an amplifier to try to filter those signals so we could test them properly. I've also been able to work on several DOD projects. Um, and currently I'm working on Europa Clipper, which I'll talk a little bit more about in my next slide. Um, but primarily I do hardware work. So cable design, um, electronic design and PCB design, that is printed circuit boards. 
So you're a book clipper. It is one of my favorite missions. Um, it is a really, really exciting mission. First of all, look at Europa. It is beautiful. And essentially, Europa Clipper is going to conduct a detailed reconnaissance of the moon Europa. Europa is Jupiter's moon. It's going to investigate whether the moon could potentially harbor conditions for life. It shows very strong evidence of liquid water underneath the icy crust. Um, instruments have the ability to be able to test and probe Europa in multiple different kinds of ways. Um, for example, one of the instruments that it's going to have is a radar that is capable of penetrating the ice because we want to know, first of all, how thick is this shell of ice that's on the surface, but also how big are the subsurface lakes or the oceans? What is underneath? What, what, what can we find? Is there microbial life, like Marianne was saying, or is there possibly something bigger? So here we have some fun trivia, but before I get into it, I want to show you this really, really cool picture. This is what we believe is going on underneath Europa. So you have the ice on the top, um, and then we have what is believed to be water plumes. So Europa is spewing out plumes of water. And ideally, we want to be able to fly through them because we have instruments that are going to be able to test what, what the contents are. Are we, are we going to find microbial life? Are we going to find the possibility of it? Are the conditions suitable? So if we are able to fly through these plumes, which have um, tons of water coming out of the surface, it's going to be a really, really amazing experience. So here we have the trivia. Europa Clipper will orbit which body? Is it going to orbit Europa? Is it going to orbit Jupiter? Or is it not going to orbit at all and it will simply fly by and past Europa? So I'll give you guys a couple seconds to think about that one. All right, so I see someone saying Jupiter, someone saying Europa, some saying it will fly by. We have a lot of conflicting answers here. Um, so when I actually first started this mission, I thought or Europa Clipper was going to orbit Europa because it's called Europa Clipper, right? Um, but no, actually it's going to be orbiting Jupiter. And the reason for this is that Jupiter has a very, very strong magnetic field. And this magnetic field, what it does is essentially it creates an intense radiation belt around Jupiter. And this radiation would fry the spacecraft um, very, very quickly. And we wouldn't be able to get the data that we would want to get out of it. So for that reason, it is going to orbit Jupiter. and Essentially what it's gonna do is it's going to get as far away from Jupiter as possible while it's not near Europa. And then as it approaches Europa, it's going to fly very, very close to the moon. Um, how close? Well, it's gonna vary from 1600 miles to 16 miles above the surface for the closest approach. Um, so the photos we're gonna be able to get from that are really, really insane. I am so excited. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katia. That was really interesting. I love learning about all the aspects of what you guys do in the space industry. Um, next up, we have Kate Gunderson. Um, everyone, please welcome Kate. Hi, guys. Um, let me just share my screen here. <clears throat> working. There we go. Can you guys see that okay? okay. Yes. Yes. All right. Sweet. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So I'm Kate Gunderson and um, I'm a mechanical and aerospace engineer and I work at NASA's Johnson Space Center 
And I just want to kind of take you guys through my journey and how I got my dream job and kind of talk to you a little bit about what I do. So um, we'll get into this. Um, I got my bachelor's degree at the Rochester Institute of Technology. That's a, a technical school um, for like a university in Rochester, New York. And I got my mechanical engineering degree there. I knew I wanted to go into aerospace, but um, uh, I wanted kind of like a more broad um, degree that I felt could uh, be used in any any industry. So I ended up going with mechanical engineering and focusing, getting a focus in aerospace. Um, and then after that, I, I'll, well, I'll get into my co-ops in a little bit, but I started co-oping because they have a, it's actually a five-year program because they require you to do internships along the way. Um, so before I started working full-time, I decided I wanted to get a more advanced degree as well. So I went um, and got my master's degree at Georgia Tech. Um, I got my master's in aerospace engineering. And while I was there, I did research in real time, implementing real time structural health monitoring into Har Army Blackhawks. Um, and so that was a really, really great experience. And I'll, I'll be talking about that a little more um, and I can answer your questions, but I felt like my master's degree was a really great time for me to kind of um, grow my technical competence as well as my self-confidence in my technical abilities. And then also um, just learn how to find the answers to difficult questions by myself. So I actually did seven internships, which far exceeded the required amount of internships, but I just loved how they made me feel like I, even if the engineering classes were really difficult, they made me feel like I could really be a good engineer and, and built my self-confidence that way. So I did two with GE Aviation. And after the first one, I worked um, like on a part of an aircraft engine. And I knew that I was a big picture person and I wanted to work on the entire aircraft. So I ended up um, working my way out to uh, Victorville, California for my second internship. And I worked in flight test engineering, which is the picture here. Um, I'm in one of their 747s that they test their aircraft engines on. Um, and then I ended up actually going to NASA before uh, for my first internship um, before I went to the House of Representatives. But I'll talk about that one here um, just because it's kind of a unique experience for an engineer to do this kind of thing. Um, but I knew that um, in Congress, we don't have that many um, congressmen and women that are scientists and engineers. So I wanted to get a unique perspective because they're making decisions that impact our lives every day. So um, that was a really unique experience. And if you guys have questions, I can answer them later. But, but it was really a cool um, opportunity that's a little different than maybe the typical journey. Um, and then I did, let's see, four internships with uh, NASA Johnson Space Center. And I actually uh, dreamt of working for NASA as early as second grade. Um, you can see there's a picture of me where I dressed up as Sally Ride. Um, it was actually a snowmobiling suit that I taped a, <laughs> an American flag to and I stood in front of the class and I was so proud because she was really inspiring to me. And that kind of um, is where my love for space began. Um, something that's really interesting, I think, is that I applied to, I initially applied to 15 different NASA internships and I didn't hear back about a single one. And so I felt a little, um, you know, <laughs> down but I actually just like kept moving forward with it. I emailed every single NASA center and told them I wanted to work for them and sent them my resume. And I'm not kidding you, they actually, a couple of them emailed me back and that's how I ended up getting my first internship with them. Um, so that's just a reminder that sometimes something better is just around the corner and keep pushing forward. Um, so that's how I got my foot in the door at NASA. A lot of times these internships are great ways for you to it's like an extended job interview. So it's kind of a good way to get your foot in the door. Uh, one of my internships there was in mission control. Um, I did um, a couple other ones. This one with me in the mask was, uh, I was testing a spacesuit wrist bearing so that when we go to the moon, uh, they don't, our spacesuits don't lock up from all the dust intrusion. Um, so I just have some fun photos to share from work. Um, some of these, I was an intern. Um, this one giant airplane here is the Super Guppy. We can actually transport other aircraft in there. We transported parts of the space station in there um, while we were getting ready to launch parts of the space station. Um, the cool thing is I actually got to flight test one of my projects um, in the Super Guppy. It was an iPad mount that the pilots still use in the cockpit today. 
And so I, I told them, I, we need to flight test this in a dynamic uh, environment. And, and they're like, we know you just want to fly, but uh, that's, that's okay. I think it's a good idea. So it was a really, really cool experience. And then there's a picture here of me with uh, one of our T-38 jet engines that uh, is on full afterburner. Um, so once I started full time in 2018, after I was done with graduate school, I was put on the Gulfstream team. Um, we have two Gulfstream business jets that we've outfit for, um, we, we do two primary missions with these aircraft. Um, one of our main missions is to fly over to Kazakhstan and pick up the astronauts when they land from the space station. And our other mission is um, to fly airborne science for, uh, for the science community. And so I am now an alternate project engineer on this aircraft, meaning I'm uh, a liaison between the program and the engineering team. So I kind of oversee all the projects on the, uh, this aircraft. This one here is the G5. We also have a G3, which is a little older, but it's really cool because the G5 was actually purchased from, used from Nike. Um, and over on the left, this is a picture of a T-38. These are what the astronauts train in and what um, we actually, uh, we use these same exact aircraft to train for our missions to the moon um, back in the Apollo days. So anyway, on the bottom here, I, my one of my primary duties is I'm the uh, the point of contact for our optical glass windows. We put two optical glass windows in the bottom of the aircraft for airborne science missions, so we can shoot uh, lasers and take uh, pictures of the Earth um, and use the data for um, you know different things like to map how the ice thickness of the ice sheets is changing and map the ocean and things like that. So these, each of these windows is uh, $30,000. They're one and a half inches thick fused silica optical uh, glass. And um, in graduate school, I did, I took some classes on fracture mechanics. So I actually determined the damage tolerance of these windows. Optical glass is um, very brittle. So um, it's really important that we don't have any major flaws in these windows. If we do, we need to know how long we can fly with them before it would be catastrophic and um, fail. They fail very um, catastrophically uh, compared to like metals would. So uh, the bottom right, I am actually practicing my window cleaning techniques on an old space shuttle window. Uh, and then one of my other duties that I just started earlier this year is, and I'll play the video. I am now a flight science officer. Here we are doing a touch and go um, on the G3. So a flight science officer flies along with the aircraft for different missions, particularly airborne science, and we operate equipment or we help the um, customer, airborne science customer with any issues they may have. And we're considered air crew, so it's pretty cool. We're on a team with the pilots and we go, like this one's in Reno, Nevada. We were flying over the Western United States to map um, snow water equivalent for the SnowX missions this winter. And you can read more about that online as well. Um, I don't wanna take up too much of my time. So um, I just wanna mention one thing uh, as a piece of advice I have. And that's uh, something my dad told me when I was struggling with imposter syndrome before I started graduate school. And I told him, I don't know why people think I'm so smart. I'm not smart. I just, I just work really hard. And he said to me, being smart and working hard are the same thing. And that made me realize something that I'll never forget. And that is that if you're willing to work hard, um, it can't be matched and your dreams will never be out of reach. People will respect you if you work hard. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to leave my um, social media info here so that you guys can connect with me and I'd love to hear more from you. And uh, I also have a blog, it's www.caitlingunderson.com. And I actually just did a post about, uh, I just applied to be an astronaut for the first time, which is a dream job of mine. And um, you can see how the application process works if you um, read my latest blog post. So here's my trivia question. Um, when does NASA plan to resume launching astronauts to, this, uh, to space from US soil? I'll give you some time to answer. Another cool thing about my job is we uh, have astronauts walking around all the time. So they're all over Houston. So they're, they're not as much celebrities as they might be everywhere else. But. <laughs> I see an A, May 27th. Anybody else? I 
I see some more A's. Yep, the answer is A. We're planning to launch with SpaceX, two astronauts, on May 27th, 2020. So I'm getting ready to go um, shuttle some mission managers and um, families out to the Cape pretty soon here to get ready for that launch. So I'm looking forward to that. Thanks, guys, so much. It was uh, really great talking to you. Thank you so much, Kate. That was so informative. You guys, it is so amazing that even during quarantine time, we could share all of our projects and we could get to know you guys so like individually, um, stepping out of Instagram into this YouTube live. I learned so much about you guys and I hope the audience enjoys, enjoys this and they got to learn a whole bunch of cool stuff stuff about your projects. So I am so happy. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Kate, for your presentation. Thanks, Nalia. Thanks, Katia. Thanks, Marianne. That was so informative. Okay, so now for the second part of our um, YouTube live seminar, we are going to go into panel discussions. So we have three sections. Um, our first section is academia. Our second one is mental health. And then our third one is going to be tips and advice for um, college students looking into becoming, you know, aerospace engineers, chemical engineers, electrical engineers for the space industry. So let's go ahead and go into our first panel discussion, um, which is academia. So I have this question for you guys. And for the audience, if you guys have questions for our panelists, please put them in the YouTube live comment section and we'll get to your questions um, at the end. So let's go ahead and start with our first question. So our first question is, how did you obtain your first opportunity to work in the space industry? This is open to all the panelists. So whoever would like to answer, please go ahead. I'll repeat the question one more time. How did you obtain your first opportunity to work in the space industry? So we'll go ahead and get Katya to answer that first. So for me, um, I have always wanted to work in the space industry and specifically NASA. And I had all of these plan A, plan B, plan C about how it's going to achieve that. And um, really, it started with first and foremost, getting the confidence to put that application in, because I think I was really scared at the beginning of that rejection of my dream job that I wasn't even applying. So my junior year in college was when I decided, OK, I'm, I'm really going to do this and I'm going to try really hard to do it right. Uh, and I think that the biggest thing that helped me out is I, I was really putting myself out there and trying to get those personal connections. So anytime JPL came to campus for an event or anytime there was a career fair and JPL was there, there was a conference and JPL was there. I was there making sure that I got to know the, the recruiters, that they got to know me, um, and that if they were gonna be a multiple ones, that I would be there and reminding them, hey, remember me, I'm still interested. And really, at the end of the day, I think that's, that's what made the difference for me. Um, I still did have to wait, I think, from the first application I submitted to when I actually heard back, it was about five months. So also having the patience to keep trying, keep applying, and not losing that confidence is, is what helped me. Wow, thank you so much, Katia, for that advice. So hunt down the recruiter, don't give up, keep letting them know who you are, what you do, and what you wanna do at NASA. So that's really great advice. Um, so let's go ahead and get Kate to answer the question. How did you obtain your first opportunity to work in the space industry, Kate? All right. So um, I first did my I did my first internship with GE Aviation, which was a really great way to show that um, I had some experience and um, I was um, just like a capable engineer. I guess I had some experience under my belt. But even more important than that, I think what um, really set me apart was I um, like I mentioned, I emailed all the NASA centers my resume. And I think um, doing something like that that sets yourself apart and really um, like not, not a lot of people might think to just like directly email the person that is hiring, but I think it's a really great way to show how interested you are and kind of get your resume in front of them. And um, so that's how I did that. And like I said, once you kind of um, get your foot in the door for an internship, it's a really great way to show firsthand um, that you're a really hard worker, that you are really capable. And um, so that's how I did it. 
Awesome. Okay, so your advice is get experience first before you go ahead and apply to NASA, um, your dream job. So that kind of gives you the opportunity to show that you are a capable engineering student for, and you qualify for all the opportunities for that job position. So thank you so much, Kate, for your advice. Um, let's go ahead and get Naya to get, um, so how did you find your first opportunity to work in the space industry? Sure. Um, so I definitely agree with, with what the other lady said, um, but I also have to add in, I actually got my first internship by going to a conference. So the conference I attended was the National Society of Black Engineers National Conference or annual conference. And um, I just kind of put myself um, in the, in, in, I guess, you have to prepare your resume, which I actually had help with. So I had a lot of mentors who had experience and who kind of knew what I needed to add there. And then the experience I got like to add to my resume was actually through clubs. So I know a lot of people have the gripe with, you need experience to get experience. And so um, the experience I had was through joining recreational rocket club. So there's a rocket club on campus at Riddle called the, um, Oh, I actually forgot what it's called, but it's actually a, a section of SEDS, which is Space um, Explorers Development, something like that. And what we did is we did model rocketry, which I showed you the pictures or the video from my presentation of what, you know, one of my model rockets looked like. So even that experience made me a little bit more of a desirable candidate for a company because I got to see my coursework come alive through model rocketry. Even though it wasn't a professional experience, it was still experience. So if you're doing anything recreationally, if it's technical, make sure that you talk to a mentor um, to see about whether or not it's something you should add to your resume because you could be selling yourself short by not adding that information. So hope that helps. That is yeah. awesome. It's yeah, that's awesome yeah. advice. Um, Naya, um, I think that's really great advice that you said, join an organization, join a club at school that does technical projects. Usually these organizations, when you do technical projects, you get to present in conferences, right? Um, so you get all the skills necessary and you could definitely start planning out your resume, getting that experience necessary so that you qualify for that internship or that first job. That's amazing, great advice, you guys. So let's go ahead and get to Amy. Right, so I love everything you guys had to share about how you guys got your first internship. Um, Naya, I feel like a lot of people have this, a lot of engineers have this question, which is why did you decide to go into research rather than industry? So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Absolutely. Um, so I got to say, it's definitely a little tricky um, making that decision. Um, I made that decision based off of what I wanted to focus on in my career. And so a lot of people don't initially know that straight out of undergrad, you know, what they want to focus on in their um, industry career, you know. Um, but I, I kind of knew that. And so that was electric propulsion. And when I did my summer internship with NASA Glenn in 2018, and I like step I just kind of jumped straight into electric propulsion. Like I had, I'd never taken a class in it. I did, I did everything and I knew everything about it through, um, through teaching myself, through reading papers online and watching videos and explanations. And so I kind of jumped head first into it. And what I noticed when I started working at Glenn um, doing electric propulsion is all of my colleagues have PhDs. And um, the people who didn't have PhDs, they had masters. And if they didn't have a masters, they were typically on their way to retirement. And by that, I mean, they probably entered the field a long time ago. So things have since changed. And so um, it was clear to me that to be competitive in that industry, I needed to have a PhD. I needed to have specialized um, knowledge about this um, particular industry. And so that's kind of what drove my decision. That was part of it. The other side of it is it was it's a personal fulfillment thing for me like i always wanted my phd i always wanted to be the first doctor in my family um so that you know other people in my family can see me as an example and i can be an example to other little girls that look like me so those are two um those are the two sides of the coin for me but i would definitely say you it, there is such thing of being um overqualified and i have met people who won't hire a phd in the space industry because you just have too much knowledge. So again, that's why it makes it a little tricky, 
um, I would just say do as much industry uh, research you can before making that decision. Wow, now the, the Naya, that is so inspiring. Not only are you inspiring your community, you are inspiring the Engineering Gals Network. Right now we're inspiring the world um, for everyone to pursue their PhD and you know have that dream of becoming an astronaut. So that's amazing. So, okay, so we have a third question. Um, this is for Marianne. Marianne, what would you recommend for people who are looking into going to graduate school? We know we all go and get our bachelor's degree. It is expensive school is very expensive how do you manage that how do you pay for graduate school if you do decide to get a master's degree yeah so i went to usc for a master's and usc is notorious for being really expensive i had uh, no college fund or anything so what i ended up doing was just pay uh doing federal loans and something i learned while i was looking into my master's was that there's no grant like federal grants available um, really, so it's mostly loans, or if you can get scholarships, that's great. Uh, but if you're going for your PhD, that's a little different because you usually get like stipends and you'll be compensated for uh, your time at the, the university. So it just depends if you want to get your master's or your PhD. Uh, sometimes your employer will pay for your uh, a portion of your tuition as well. So Let's say like you have a job already, look into how they can give you some compensation to help pay for your tuition and reimbursements. If you're going straight from your undergrad to grad school, that's a little different. So you kind of have to find your own money to do that. So definitely take that into account and you know, look into how long, how many years you're going to be paying off these loans, because that's definitely something you should consider. And I, I know it's not easy, like it's expensive, but it's definitely a good investment. And just take all these things into consideration when you're thinking about grad school. Okay, so definitely be financially smart with your money. School does cost and you have to remember that you are paying these student loans back. So you recommend to either work full-time for a company and have a company pay for a portion of your graduate program, um, or also take out student loans, apply to scholarships, you guys. There's tons of scholarships out there. Um, so that's really great advice. Thank you, Marianne. So let's go ahead and ask Kate. Kate, what would you recommend um, for people that are looking into grad graduate school? Like how can they pay for graduate school? What's your experience? So I have a little bit of a different story. Um, in my case, I knew that I had taken out a, a, like a lot of money for undergrad because I went to a private school and I knew that it was going to be really difficult for me to take out more loans for a master's degree. So I um, started early applying and I reached out to professors that were doing research in the area I was interested in. And I told them I was interested in their research, wanted to learn more. And I sent them my resume, um, told them what I did and said, I'd love for you to learn more about me as well. And I heard back from um, several and um, others I didn't, and that's okay. You need to reach out to as many as you can. And um, because of that, um, I kind of had an advisor vouch for me to the um, to the committee that um, brings in the graduate students for that school. And um, I was very upfront that I uh, wanted funding for my master's degree. And um, there were a couple of bumps along the road where it seemed like he wasn't going to end up paying me, but I was very persistent about it. And I was very straightforward and direct. And because of that, he offered me a fully funded master's degree. Um, and I didn't even have to do a thesis. Um, so I think that was maybe, I don't know if that's a unique story or not, but, um, I'm very grateful that, um, I had a fully, um, the tuition was all funded, so I didn't take out any more loans. And then I also got a stipend, um, a monthly stipend that was enough for me to live on. And, uh, and like I said, not take out any more loans. So I would recommend, um, just starting your hunt early and, um, being very upfront about, um, but tactful about the fact that you need money. So. Thank you so much, Kate. Yeah, I feel like that's really helpful information, especially for somebody who's not sure where they're going to get their funding from after um, getting their bachelor's. I know for me, I just went straight into industry. I didn't go get my master's, but I think that's really helpful information um, 
for everyone. And so uh, one other question that we often get is, how do I get involved in the space industry as an international student? Um, I think Marianne, if you would like to answer that question. Yeah, so I personally work with a lot of international colleagues and a lot of them I work with are postdocs. So they're trying to get their PhD and they're, they need to do a postdoc to officially uh, do their, uh, to graduate. And so, and uh, some others are like foreign nationals as well. And they work on a different, a lot of different projects. So like research projects, some of them are, are able to work on projects that are actually flying as well. So for JPL, it's a little different from the, the NASA centers because we're run by Caltech technically. So we're a government contractor and there's ways to get positions as an international student. So you can, like I said, do postdocs or you could do fellowships and you could find other space grants that allow for international students. It is the case that most of NASA is uh, civil servants, but for like contractors, you can, there are ways to get a international employee involved. So there are certain, very specific ways to do that. So it's definitely possible. And that's it. Okay, guys, thank you so much. That's going to be extremely helpful, helpful for all our international students watching this live worldwide. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get a question from our audience. Um, so I saw a question from, I'm sorry if I cannot pronounce your name, but it's pa um, Pariah Karmi. And her question is, um, what can we do in high school in order to get funded for the university? Um, and how can we straighten our resume? So she is a high school student and she's looking into getting the university tuition paid for and how can she, you know, um, start building up her resume. Let's go ahead and go with Naya. Go ahead, Naya. Absolutely. Um, that's a great question. Um, I just wanted to make sure this was mentioned uh, when it comes to strengthening your resume and as a high schooler. Um, Personally, in high school, I got involved with a few STEM outreach organizations um, that were local to the Orlando area, because that's where I grew up. Um, but unfortunately, not everybody has access to those. So if you don't, something I saw was very interesting that MIT and a few other um, universities offer are um, online certification classes. So MIT offers, um, I believe it's called MIT edX, something of the sort, where they offer um, intro to aerospace engineering, intro to astrophysics, um, all these different introductory classes that you can pay $50 and I believe get um, a certification, like an official certification to add to your resume. Um, and I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but honestly, a lot of the times, um, you know, reasonable recruiters will understand that you may not have access to get that experience, but doing something as simple as an online certification course with MIT shows initiative. So I just wanted to make sure that was plugged. Okay, great advice, Naya. So go ahead and find online sources. As of right now, there's plenty, plenty of online classes that are open tuition free because of quarantine. So please take your time, very serious. Um, if you're looking into going to the space industry, please get as much knowledge as you can as early as high school. That's amazing. If you start now, you'll have so much knowledge by the time you graduate college. So thank you very much for that live question. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and ask you guys fun facts about you. So we learned about your projects. We learned what, what kind of engineer you are. So now we kind of want to know some fun facts about you guys. So let's go ahead and go with the first question. Um, what helps you stay motivated? So let's go ahead and have Marianne answer that. Marianne, what keeps you motivated? I, whenever I'm feeling like I am lacking motivation, what I like to do is, watch some of my favorite like space media. So maybe reminisce about a launch that I watched and look at, look at all the pictures I have from my past like NASA experiences. And that kind of reignites my passion. 
And then I will also go to a lot of seminars related to space. So at JPL, they have a lot of speakers come in and just watching them speak about space and th what they're studying and their science makes me really excited and that keeps me motivated. So I think it's definitely talking to other colleagues a lot and just, you know, exchanging ideas about space and that helps me stay motivated and uh, helps my work ethic. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marianne, for that. So just look at your inspiration. Whatever inspires you, go back and watch it, um, and they'll definitely keep you into that hard work zone. So let's go ahead and ask one more question, one more fun fact about you. Um, what's your go-to music when you're studying or when you're working? Um, do you guys have like a you know music uh a music list, a playlist that you guys go to, a favorite artist? Um, what do you do while you're working just to keep yourself like motivated and keep going at it? So let's go ahead and get Naya to answer that. <laughs> um, my favorite music is, it can't be sad music or I'm gonna wanna be sad. It can't be like R&B or I'm gonna wanna sing and I'm not able to focus. <laughs> so I actually listen to um, Caribbean music. Uh, my family is actually from, my family from Trinidad. And so I grew up in that culture and we have a genre of music called soca. And soca is considered like jump up, feel good. Uh, you're jumping, you're happy. Um, it's just fun music. And so I listen to that to keep me going. Awesome. I do the same thing. I listen to cumbias, to salsa, to get myself motivated, go back to the culture, remember where your ancestors came from, what you're doing to become a better person and a better person for your community. Thank you so much, Naya. So now you guys, thank you so much for joining our first half of our YouTube live seminar. We are going to take a five minute intermission. This is going to give us some time for us to just get some water, get up. We've been on live for over an hour. Um, so let's go ahead and do a five minute intermission. We're gonna play our video. And then after that, we're gonna come back and then we're gonna finish the seminar with our two panel discussions that are pending, mental health, mental health, and also um, how to, um, what, what kind of advice um, our panelists would give to any students or any college students, young professionals looking into going into the space industry. So you guys enjoy the video and we'll see you guys in five minutes. But don't forget, come back, okay? So, I mean, our video is going to play, but don't leave. We will still be here. We just need a little bit of relaxed time for a couple minutes. We'll be back.
Welcome back. Go ahead. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so, hope you guys had a chance to stretch out your legs. And our second panelist discussion is mental health. And we always have a lot of questions when it comes to mental health. How do you balance your work life, your school life, and um, 
especially when um, your, sometimes your classes are really hard. So some of the questions that, uh, one of the questions that I have lined up here is, have any of you experienced imposter syndrome? If so, how do you address it? All right, so Katya, if you'd like to answer that. Yeah, um, I think this also goes back to what I was talking about, how for the longest time I was really terrified to apply for my dream job because I didn't want to face that rejection, essentially. Um, and when I started my job at JPL, I remember there were days where I would drive to work and I would sit in my car and I would kind of just be terrified to get into the office because I knew that today I was going to have a review for a board design or I was going to have to plug in my board for the first time and possibly have to, you know, face what was going to happen if it didn't work or something like that. And so I was I was really terrified for a very long time. And I started to realize that it was impacting my work because I was coming in and I was scared and it was really hard for, for me to shake that off for those couple of first few hours of my work day. Um, and really what started to happen is I started to kind of just think about all of those times in the past where I felt like I wasn't ready for something, where I felt like I wasn't going to succeed and how no matter what, each of those times I actually did succeed and I did end up finishing my tasks, not only finishing it, but doing it very well. So now something that I, I do, because I still face this every day, is I try to, you know, have those feelings, let them set in and then think about all those times in the past where I felt this exact same thing and I made it through it. And really that's what's been able to give me the confidence. My track record has been able to give me the confidence to say, okay, there's been so many times in the past where I felt this exact thing and I was able to do it. And I mean, just recently I went back to my first assignment on my Europa Clipper project and I was looking through it and thinking, oh my gosh, this is, so easy but i remember at the time i was freaking out because i'd never done something like it so really it was one of those moments where i was able to kind of have that um feeling of looking back and remembering how i felt but also knowing how i feel now of like oh my gosh this i, I can do this so i try to go back to that every time Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I've definitely experienced imposter syndrome myself, and um, and it's really difficult. Um, I, I I've done the same thing. I would say I like to write letters to myself or remind myself in some way, some way or another that hey, like I've gone through so much that I could still persevere and just remember my accomplishments, even like if they're one one little thing at a time that I've always kept going. So um, I, I really related to that advice. So thank you so much for sharing, Katya. Um, Marianne, is there anything else you would like to add to that? Yeah, I totally agree with Katya. Also working at JPL, it's very intimidating, to be honest. And my first year there, I was essentially nervous, like every day going into work and to my anxiety was at a high level. So. I actually, uh, it took a while for me to start going to therapy and actually talking about and addressing my issues with anxiety. And I, I still do therapy right now and that's helped me tremendously just deal with imposter syndrome and looking and not having this kind of all or nothing mentality where I'm either a failure or I'm not. It's not, that's not the case. It's like you, it's okay to feel, but you can also work towards achieving your goals if you just remember all the good things that you've done and your accomplishments. And I have to remind myself of that every day, all the time, still up to now. And it's, it's a very real thing for me. And uh, one thing that also helps is to, you know, all, like I said before, is just to keep my motivation and reignite my passion. And it gets easier as time goes on because the more like you have to talk to people and present your ideas to them, the more you talk in meetings, it just gets a little bit easier each time. So as an early career person, you definitely experience that, especially coming out of college, you feel like almost like a quarter life crisis. It happens to everybody and it's okay. 
uh, just remember to, you know, do what you need to do. If it, that means therapy, then just do it. If that means uh, journaling um, and talking to people who support you, I think it's really important to have mentors uh, that you look up to and work, but also who appreciate the work that you do. Um, it's not necessarily looking for other people's validation, but it's important to build a support system and to talk to people who feel the same way as you. Because there's definitely people at work who feel the same way as me, like they don't feel good enough. And it's all very intimidating. It's extremely competitive. So just know that you're like, you're not alone. And a lot of people are experiencing the same thing. And yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Marianne. Um, yeah, I definitely really connected to everything that you shared. Um, it's, you know, I feel like it's really important to have people who recognize that. I, I like the approach that you took of your, it's not all or nothing, that I'm neither, I'm not just only a failure just because I, I'm struggling with something, um, that you're a human being who's involved, evolving and always learning and growing, right? And that's very important that you mentioned that this sort of anxiety of, of, tends to happen more towards the beginning of our careers when we're unsure about our potential or capability or just struggling in some uh, way or another. And I just want to say thank you so much for sharing that and opening up about it because a lot of people, um, it's important to talk about these issues because a lot of people don't talk about them. And a lot of the times it feels like, Oh, is it just in my head? Am I the only person who's struggling with this? But I've noticed, at least when I've shared um, as well, is I feel a lot better. And then at the same time, um, other people can feel a lot less alone and know that, okay, they're not alone in this situation and that this affects many people on the regular. So thank you so much, Marianne. Um, Naya, I believe you have something to share as well. Sure, yeah definitely going to echo um, Marianne there with therapy. And I know these are unprecedented times. I personally am um, I'm taking advantage of my school's virtual therapy, where we do it via BlueJeans, which is a video conferencing app. But if you don't have access to any of those types of resources, um, there are a lot of mental health apps that, that I found useful. Um, a few off the top of my head are WellTrack, which helps track your mood and then provides like meditation techniques and, and helps you to kind of um, kind of determine where those feelings are coming from and then you know assessing them from there. And another one is called BetterHelp, which I believe is all online, um, uh, what do you call it, therapy. It does cost money, but you can actually get, uh, you can get insurance, which is pretty interesting. Um, so those are just some online virtual resources I wanted to share for those who don't have access to a virtual therapist. Um, thank you so much. I think that's, I, I love that you shared a resource because now if I am struggling with something, I know exactly where to go or at least one avenue that I could take to kind of help myself, you know, and different things work for different people, but it's nice to know that those resources and that information is out there for us. Um, so thank you so much, everyone who, who talked about and shared their experience with imposter syndrome. Um, we have another question, and that is, describe a time when, when you experienced failure and how you handled that. So I believe, Kate, would you like to uh, talk about that? Yeah, so um, I touched on this a little earlier, but um, something really interesting is that my very first um, interview for an internship uh, was at my school's career fair, and uh, it was for a job in manufacturing. And um, the guy interviewing me asked if I could handle getting my hands dirty. And I remember thinking, <laughs> I had never been asked something like this, like so explicitly uh, gender biased. And I didn't really know how to expl how to uh, respond. And I said, uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> and so um, at the end of the day, I didn't get the job. And um, I remember being so disappointed because I thought I had like a lot to offer and um, a lot of really good things on my resume. But um, something really important to remember that I like, touched on earlier is that um, maybe something better is about to come along. And because I didn't get that internship, 
I worked even harder to get my dream job at NASA, my dream internship, and it just really motivated me even more to work towards that goal instead of being distracted by this other job where maybe I wouldn't have been treated that well anyway. And um, so it turned out for the better. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, I can I can relate to that, to feeling that you have to, the feeling of struggling after you failed at something and then, but also getting that fire kick in, kicked in and then being really excited and putting in even more effort and energy into the next opportunity that's out there. So I, I, I love that. And um, um, Katya, is there anything you'd like to share? Yeah, so I remember um, my first mistake on a PCB board. And I mean, I have an example here. So printed circuit board, you know, when you are designing it, everything has to be perfect because if one of these parts is designed wrong and you're actually having the physical component and trying to put it on top of it, it's not going to fit. And if it doesn't fit, then your circuit's not going to work. And so I designed a footprint and footprints are basically um, these where the components go on and the holes were too small. So the part couldn't actually go through. Um, they had already been done. They had already been printed. Uh, it, they Essentially the way they found out is they had the part physically and they were trying to stuff it in and they couldn't because of the holes and the clearances were at the point where you couldn't just make the holes bigger and try to stuff it in because there was stuff around. So. Um, it was a pretty big mistake and it's something that I had been terrified of for a very long time because when you're designing these, you know, you know that it needs to be right and the stress of that is extreme, especially knowing, no, I'm not just going to get a prototype one so I can check and make sure it's okay. We're ordering a hundred right off the bat. And so I was terrified and when I found out, I mean, I didn't know what to do. Like what? what am I supposed to do? Do I uh, say sorry? Do I say like, I didn't really know how to handle it. Um, and I think that everyone's reactions to it were so positive and comforting to me. Um, I was really allowed to essentially fix my mistake, um, learn my lesson. Nobody was telling me, you know, oh, you did something wrong. You're not good enough for this job. You can't. Um, keep up with the pressure. I didn't hear those things at all because we're all human. They've all made mistakes. And actually really what I ended up hearing was all about the times that they'd made mistakes and how my mistake, which had essentially cost us a few thousand dollars, was nothing in comparison to some of the mistakes that they had made. So really just everyone trying to make me feel comfortable in this moment. I think I, I'm really grateful for that experience because now I'm not afraid. Um, not to say that I'm going to go and keep making mistakes, but I think not having that pressure on my shoulders anymore has allowed me to do a much better job. Yeah, that's, um, I love that you shared that because it shows how important it is to have a community around you that supports you and lifts you up rather than, um, you know, in some cases it can be the other way around, right? And you never know, but it's yeah, it's just as important to realize that your mistakes don't define you. Um, so yeah, so Naya, I, I believe, uh, would you like to answer that question as well? Sure. Um, so mine is I have plenty of mistakes to share in industry and like in my career, but mine is actually academic. And it's when I failed my first class in college. And it was not fun. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background with not talking too much. Um, it was junior year and I had a full cor course load. Um, it's it's junior year aerospace engineering classes, meaning everything's aerospace. There's no kind of buffer classes. And so um, I was taking Aerodynamics 2, which um, in, in my catalog year, Aerodynamics 2 basically comprised just compressible aerodynamics. So um, I'm an aerospace engineer. Aerodynamics is extremely um, <laughs> fundamental to my degree. And I failed that class. There was a lot going on in my life. I was serving on like the regional board for uh, the National Society of Black Engineers. I was in a nonprofit called Dream Source. I was traveling all the time um, and it was rough. I also worked two jobs on campus because I had to, you know, uh, just my, my income level was low. And so I had to support myself in some ways. Um, so it was rough, but 
And none of that really mattered to the professor. Um, we had our own issues as well that I actually had to go take to the dean. But again, none of that mattered. What I got was a D. And it was my first time failing. It brought my cumulative GPA to like a 3.1. I'm on scholarship. So if I fall below like a 3.0, I cannot, I can't go to school anymore. So there was, it was just like a ripple effect of like terrible things and terrible thoughts in my head that for me, I just kind of believe like, okay, I got a D, no grad school is going to want me. And by mind you, this is junior year, my spring semester junior year, which is when you start applying to grad schools with the GPA you have at that time. So I was freaked out. I just thought all of my dreams and goals and plans were in the gutter. Um, and uh, it, it took a lot for me to get out of there. First, I utilized a lot of different mental health resources, including the suicide hotline. No, I was not particularly like ready to, excuse me for if that was triggering by the way, trigger warning, um, but no, I wasn't ready to uh, do the act, but I was having those thoughts. And so I think a lot of people believe that in order to use that resource, they need to be um, extremely suicidal. And I don't believe that. I believe as soon as a thought comes into your head, if you have no one else to talk to, please call the hotline. And so I like to share that, um, but at the end of the day, uh, it took me like about a month or two to recuperate <laughs> from that pain. Um, I, I just decided that that wouldn't be the end of my story. Um, I retook the class um, in this fall semester of my senior year, and um, I actually ended up getting an A. I took 18 credit hours that semester so I could still graduate within four years. Not, not that there's anything wrong with graduating in later than four years. Again, I'm on scholarship, and so after four years, no more scholarship. So I still had to hustle. Um, and, and I was able to come out victorious in the end, just because I tried again. I didn't allow it to keep me down. And that was, I think, that was the decision I had to make in order to move forward. And I believe that was like, a, it, it was a breaking point or a turning point in my in my academic and, and professional career. Because how you respond to failure is gonna determine how well you're able to succeed because failure is gonna come with success no matter what happens. You're gonna experience it and it's all about how you recuperate, how you get back up and how you, like they said, um, how you dissociate your personal worth from your success and, and your personal worth as an individual from what you're able to do. And so anybody who's ever, ever failed a class, is scared of failing a class, if it has to happen, it's going to happen, and that's okay. That doesn't mean that you're dumb. That's not a measure of your aptitude, your knowledge, and what you're capable of. So, hope that helps. <laughs> Thank you so much, Naya, for sharing that. Um, um, I, I agree. When it comes to failing classes, it's really easy to kind of put yourself down and beat yourself up. Um, but I'm so glad that you shared that with us. And hopefully that helps somebody who may have struggled with that in the past. And, and, and they know now that there are resources that they can use to, and tools that they can uh, use to help themselves and uh, to respond to that failure. Because you're right, everybody does fail. And it's just a part of succeeding. You're going to fail in order to succeed. So thank you so much, Naya. Um, I have another question. Um, how do you deal with the gender bias within the engineering industry? Um, is, is that a question you would like to answer, Marianne? Yeah, I, um, so I've experienced it definitely and I've seen other women experience it, whether it's like a micro thing or if it's just explicit and they're saying, because you're a woman, X, Y, Z, uh, it varies. So. I, what I have done lately is try to find a support group. So engineering gals is a great example of like just seeing powerful women and seeing them excel in their, in their field. So just connecting with you guys has been really, really helpful. And recently at my work, there was a women's uh, sort of club that was started. So lunchtime, once a month we meet and we talk about any experiences we've had. And we also talk about our accomplishments and we try to support each other. And we also talk about how would we approach a situation? Let's say you're in a meeting and you're the only woman there. How do you deal with that? How do you build up the courage to speak up if you feel hesitant about it? 
and if you're asked to like take notes and things like that as a woman so there's like a lot of situations that I've noticed or, or that I realized from other people so it's important to just talk with other women and then talk about how would you deal with it and also like finding uh, men who are supportive of this as well so it, it's really unfortunately it is a little bit po more powerful when a man sees like a woman like struggling and he mentions it more people tend to pay attention to when the man like will say it versus like the woman saying it and complaining about it so it's really powerful to have men who support you as well and who recognize your work and not just because like you're a woman and uh, another thing I would do is to just uh, be mindful of your own bias because there was an interesting thing I learned recently about how even though we're women, we also have a bias as well. And we might not, it, it'll be unconscious, like unconsciously we'll think like, oh, this is not really typically something that I would think a woman would do or it, you don't think about it, like you don't notice it right away, but unconsciously you are thinking that because it's just so set in stone in society and everything. So just getting past that is important as well in your own kind of uh, viewpoint on things. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marianne. Um, Naya, would you like to answer that question as well? Sure. I know I just spoke, so I won't be long, but I've definitely, and I've, I've experienced gender and racial bias kind of at the same time as a double double whammy. But um, I actually had a colleague of mine straight up tell me to my face that I'm gonna have more opportunities because I'm a black woman or black girl. He didn't even call me a woman. Um, and so that was really rough, but I gotta say having my mentor there, my, my she was actually my supervisor, but also my mentor. Um, having my mentor there who just kind of stuck up for me because I kind of shrunk in that moment. I'd only been working there for a week at that point, and I had it was just so blatant that I had no idea how to respond, to be honest. And so I always praise my mentor in this situation because she jumped in and she was my voice. <laughs> um, and she was also using her own privilege to kind of check in because um, that wasn't something I felt comfortable doing because I was like, okay, I just got here. Am I going to lose my job if I go off on this guy? Um, and so it was great to have that support. And so with that, I say like, um, definitely echoing Marianne, find the people that you're comfortable with at work, at school, in, in any setting, so that you can have those type of advocates. Um, and, and sometimes you may have to be that advocate for somebody else, you know, depending on what privileges you may have. And so um, she just really inspired me to be who she was for me for the, for the next girl that's in that situation or the next person who can't, who doesn't feel comfortable defending themselves. Right, and that's so true. Um, finding that community and um, support system is huge, right? And then I always feel like, you know, we're stronger together. <laughs> so um, Kate, would you like to add anything to that? I'll be brief as well, because I think these ladies covered it um, really extremely well. Um, all I would add is that I think it's really important to find an advocate who is going to um, kind of bring opportunities to your attention that you might not consider yourself for because you're limiting your own self and like, oh, I'm not ready. I could never do well at that that particular position. Um, they can kind of bring those um, ideas uh, to the forefront of your mind and um, kind of be like, no, I think you'd be really good at this. You should give it a shot. Um, and then also I had this happen at work where um, I had a, an older male actually advocate for me in a meeting I wasn't in. And um, I really wanted that position where I'd be flying as a, a flight science officer. And he actually, I, everybody knew I had been talking about wanting this position. Some people maybe um, mentioned at the meeting that I uh, I needed to wait my turn and it wasn't, it wasn't the right time for me. And he mentioned to them why I would be uh, really great for that role and, and, and made it um, less about me and more about my um, wanting to help the organization and how it would make me a better uh, engineer for the organization and it wasn't just about me 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 and I think it's really good uh, that shows that it's really good to have an advocate in your corner who's going to speak for you when you're not there I love that I love that you have that 
advocate and it, and somebody who stands up for you, um, especially when you're not there, right? So that's huge. Um, thank you so much for sharing, Kate. Um, so we talked about a lot of important stuff. We talked about imposter syndrome. We talked about failure and what type of mental health resources that are out there for us. So I want to switch it up a little bit and get to know you guys and ask you guys some fun facts. Um, what is your guys' favorite study or work aesthetic? Kate? I don't know about you guys, but I cannot study if I'm not at a Starbucks. <laughs> I like have, to, it's weird. I have to be around other people, but it has to be somewhat quiet. So it has to like be a mix of like activity, but also quiet-ish, but uh, like some hustle and bustle. So yeah, I like love to study at Starbucks and that's like where I spend all my time studying and doing extra work. Yeah, that's so funny you say that, but I definitely am addicted to Starbucks. <laughs> and I love going and just being around other people that are studying at, on their laptop doing the same thing as you, I feel a lot more focused than I, I do at home. So that's, that's awesome. Um, Maritza, would you like to take over and introduce the next section? Yes. Okay, guys, these are all very, very important discussions. And I learned so much. And I could relate to all of you, all of your stories, because, you know, there's been instances, um, as an engineer myself, um, I've been put in those positions as well. And I'm pretty sure our audience can relate. Um, so thank you so much for being, you know, sharing your story. So, okay, so we're going to switch it up and go to our third and final panel discussion. Um, and this is just overall advice. So as you guys know, Engineering Gals, we're based on Instagram and Amy and I, we've created this brand. Um, we cr created this community. We understand the important importance of branding yourself online. Um, but as an individual, um, how do you network and how do you brand yourself online? Um, does anyone want to answer that question? Let's go ahead with uh, Katia first. Yeah, so um, one of the biggest things that I have tried to do is, first of all, you have to keep a really clean image online um, because a lot of employers and even uh, universities are looking you up online um, and not only on your LinkedIn, but also just what is up there for you. I remember actually for my JPL internship, um, my mentor did tell me that they did look me up online and one of the things that they found the most impressive were all of the recognitions and awards and interviews that I had for different newspapers and things like that, that they found just by Googling my name. So those things are very, very important. Um, personally, when I was hiring my intern for this upcoming summer for our project, we did the exact same thing. So they have their LinkedIn set up. Um, you can see their photo on there. And now you know what this person looks like. So if you do a little bit more digging, um, you're going to be able to find some other stuff because, you know, when you're hiring somebody, you're not just hiring someone who has the qualifications you're looking for. Um, this is somebody that you're going to have to work with possibly every day. So you want to hire somebody that um, you're going to get along with, that you're going to work well with. So that's, I think, my biggest tip um, in that sense to make sure that when you Google yourself, the stuff that is out there for people to see about you is something that you would want a possible employer to see. Yeah, most definitely. That is extremely important. Um, as you guys know, we're all like the last millennials um, right now. We all experience social media at such a young age, starting with um, MySpace, there was Photo Bucket, there was Facebook. Now there's Instagram, there's LinkedIn, TikTok. I mean, the list goes on and on. And you know, I kind of when I started going into college and I started Googling myself to see what images came up with my name, I found some like MySpace photo bucket photos. And I'm like, oh, my God, like, how do I delete that? Right. Um, so that's definitely very, very important. Google yourself. Go to the Google photos and see what comes up. If you don't like your photos online, try to go back and like delete it. I mean, I know I, I was trying to delete the MySpace photos, but MySpace doesn't exist anymore. Um, but that's like if you really, really dig. So definitely keep a clean state online, you guys. Um, remember, employers are looking at every single social media that you're on. 
So, you know, present yourself well online. So um, I know, Naya, you had something to add to that as well? Yes, uh, definitely echoing Katya, that's super important. Um, and quick note, I've actually met more scientists and engineers through Twitter than I have through LinkedIn. So if Twitter's your thing, if you're trying to get connected in that sense, definitely get on there. Science Twitter is huge. Um, but uh, the one I, the piece of advice I wanted to give was uh, like in the branding yourself uh, portion. And I just want to say, uh, keep it like, oh, what do I, how do I put this? Um, not stay unique, but try yourself to be memorable and be unique. Um, something I did at every conference was I, I had my business cards. And so my business cards aren't just like plain business cards. I have a picture of the earth and I have a quote on, up there. And it says, the quote says, then my Lux Mundi drawn. And it's a quote by Derek Walcott from one of his poems called A Letter from Brooklyn. And whenever I give that business card to somebody I don't know, if I'm just in passing, in, in, in a professional setting, you have no idea who you're going to meet. So have a business card or have something to give them so that they'll remember you. Um, and whenever I would give that out, somebody would be like, oh, my gosh, OK, what's this quote about? And then I'll explain it. And this quote is actually, it's, um, it's Latin for um, this is how I'm the light of the world, pretty much. And, and because I'm, I'm also I identify as Christian, being the light of the world is a biblical concept. Um, and I believe through engineering and through space exploration, that's how I'm being a light to the world. And so whenever I explain that to somebody, they're like, oh my gosh, that's so interesting. And then you've left an indelible mark on them. So um, that's just one of, one of the things I've seen work for me a lot. Uh, and the nice part is that when you go to follow up with him, they're like, oh, you're that girl with the business card and the weird quote. So, yeah. Well, that's like really great advice. Um, I have a business card, but it's not as interesting as yours, Naya. So I'll definitely add an inspirational quote so that it ingrains into people's mind and they remember me, right? You always want to leave an impression on someone, a positive impression, so they rem remember you. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, so I believe we did receive a question from the audience. Um, someone's asking about um, the research topics. Um, so go ahead, Marianne, if you want to answer that. Yeah, so uh, some research topics, if you want to do like fellowships, in the space grants and everything like that. So a lot of NASA's work is early concepts. So like we conceptualize a mission. So for instance, the stuff that I worked on, which was like very early research was the Europa melt probe. So there's no planned like mission for that yet, but people are looking for ideas. And there's a thing called a decadal survey uh, that NASA does. And it's a survey of all the NASA projects and what people are interested in for the next decade or so and what the new up and coming technologies people are into. So in a lot of the, if you go to NASA technical reports, there's a lot of uh, research topics that are on there. So you can see examples of what people have done. And the first thing that I did was uh, at Kennedy Space Center was actually research. It wasn't a, a confirmed flight project yet. It was kind of almost there, but not yet. Um, now it is officially uh, for a lunar rover, but at that time it was research. So we were trying to understand how do we take regolith from the moon? How do we, how exactly do we design something to heat it up and analyze it? Um, so it's things like that. So that's an example of in-situ resource utilization. So that's ISRU, which is on my shirt, actually. Um, uh, that's a big topic right now because in-situ resource utilization research is important for the Artemis program and Gateway because that's how we're going to get resources from the moon. That's how we're going to uh, limit our, our mass to explore the moon and explore the Mars as well. So we need to be able to use resources that we have available and like minimize what we bring with us. And um, another uh, thing you can get into like it, there's a huge like research. Uh, there's a lot of research topics you can get into. So some people I know, they're more on the chemistry side. So they'll work on materials. It depends what your discipline is. Uh, there's some physicists I know, so they work in like computational physics, so simulating like um, 
uh, particles. So it just depends. Like there's a whole lot of topics you could do. It just depends what you're passionate about and what interests you. Um, so I could, yeah, there's a lot of things you could do. So there's definitely research opportunities available for if you're an international student and you want to do fellowships and like grants and stuff. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marianne. Okay. So looking at the time, we're almost going to hit two hours. So we have six minutes left. Thank you guys for all of your questions. Now let's move on and wrap this up. Um, let's go ahead and, um, let's see. Okay, let's take it away, um, Amy, for closing remarks. All right, thank you guys. So thank you, Marianne, Katya, Naya, and Kate for your time. Thank you for being a part of the panel. Your online presence is definitely inspiring the youth to become engineers. Um, for the giveaway contest, we do have a winner, and that is Paulina Castreon. I'm sorry if I said your name wrong. Uh, Paulina, uh, please comment your name and Instagram handle in the YouTube live comment section to claim a prize. Uh, we'll, we will be contacting you with more details. Congratulations, Paulina. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, for supporting Engineering Gals, and for being on the YouTube live. We appreciate all the support we get. Um, so, okay. So, Congratulations. Um, let's go ahead and you guys, thank you to everyone who has donated to our GoFundMe um, campaign. We've raised $1,565 for a single mother in need. So thank you guys so, so, so much. I know this is gonna be in great appreciation um, to, pe uh, to the single mother who, who just needs the help financially. So thank you guys, thank you so much. Um, so now, um, you guys, so we, all of us are on Instagram. If you guys find us under engineering gals or on Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, um, Facebook, um, we have Marianne, her, um, Instagram handle is Mars Explorer. We have Naya, her, um, Instagram handle is Astoria, um, underscore. We have Kat's, um, Instagram handle. It's cat underscore E C H Z. And we have Kate's Instagram handle, which is and Dakota underscore Kate. So thank you guys so much for joining the this, our first YouTube Live. Do you guys, panelists, have anything to say for your uh, closing remarks? Okay. <laughs> Don't jump in all at once. Okay, so um, you guys know where you, uh, you guys can contact and uh, see everyone on Instagram. Uh, thank you guys so much. And I've had a wonderful time talking to every one of you and getting to know you guys a lot more. And I've, I've learned so much about the space industry. Um, thank you to the audience for joining us on our first online virtual conference. Make sure you guys follow Engineering Gals on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and stay tuned for our future events. So till next time, I'll see you guys later. Bye. Thank you, Maritza and Amy, too. <laughs> yes, I was going to say that, too. Yes, thank uh -huh. you. They did a lot of hard work for this, so. It's been fun. <laughs> awesome. I think we could just play the video now and then it's the end. <laughs> Thanks, <Did> guys. <laughs> Thanks for everyone joining in. Thank <laughs> you.